Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Every week, I bring guests to the podcast who help us better understand the many root causes of chronic medical conditions. That understanding will hopefully give us a strong foundation that we can use to make decisions that help us remain healthy. Today, I wanted to have a conversation with a nutrition expert to help guide us as she shares her tips that will ensure our nutritional decisions will serve us well. Today's guest is Maria Emmerich. Maria is a nutritionist who specializes in the ketogenic diet, which is one of our favorites, of course, exercise physiology, brain neurotransmitters, and how food can increase mental wellness. You can find her at ketomaria.com. She specializes in helping us recover from autoimmune disorders, diabetes type 1 and type 2, heart disease, cholesterol issues, alopecia, Hashimoto's, cancer, epilepsy, seizures, depression, and of course, anxiety. And many people who follow her advice are able to get off medications following the healing principles she shares. She is also an internationally best-selling author of several books, including Quick and Easy Ketogenic Cooking and the 30-Day Ketogenic Cleanse. And she's also authored 10 other books, including several cookbooks and three nutritional guidebooks, including the best-selling book Keto. And some of her readers include Holly Berry, Valerie Bertinelli, and Al Roker. So with that, I am totally excited and happy, Maria, to re- welcome to, to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for reaching out. Yeah, well, you know, I'm honored and excited. And uh, I remember the day uh, that we started following each other, and I was like, this is cool. I have somebody who I respect and and who thinks similarly. And uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing out there. And so let's get started. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that R in the ROPE acronym. And that R focuses on having healthy relationships. And, you know, in fact, I just released a video uh, uh, actually about the relationship that um, I have with my uh, father-in-law. So I'm looking forward to getting that out and because he's really had a huge impact on my life. So, you know, for those uh, listening and watching, just go to the YouTube channel. You'll see it there. So, but let's start our question with a relationship question for you. And my question is, I know you have a a partner that you're taking your life journey with. His name is Craig. So talk a little bit about how that wonderful romance got started. Oh, man, I was only 17 years old. And he was quite a bit older than I was. Um, But I just, he's the nicest man, the kindest, hardest, like just such a sweet person. Right away, I knew that I wanted to spend time with him. And I'm an introvert. I could hang out in the woods by myself for years. And my parents never thought I would get married because I am such a independent person. Um, but when I met him, we went on the Colorado trail and it was, gosh, a whole month of hiking, really difficult terrain. And I was only 18 then. I think he was what, 20, 26 or 27 then. And, um, when we came home, my mom said, if you still like him after that, you guys are going to get married. And sure enough, uh, we were married before I was 21 and I told him before we got married that I, I was told I couldn't have my own children because I had something called PCOS. Mm-hmm. And I said, I really want to adopt children. I don't want to go through the fertility rigmarole. And he goes, all right, I want to adopt too. You know, like, let's do it. And so just for him to be so open to bring in children. And what was even cooler about this story is when we were given pictures of Micah and Kai, they said, which one do you want? And before I could say anything, he said, both. Mm. so just the fact that he's so um he homeschools our kids uh he's just the nicest person i just oh i'm gonna start tearing up Ah. he just has such a big heart i'm very lucky to have him he has had a very tough road with health um that has rocked our world in many many ways that i never realized would be possible um and it's challenged us in many ways but He's my, I mean, he's my lobster, you know, like, (laughs) you know, he's just my person. I love being with him, whether he's sick or not. I'm, 
I'm next to him in the bed holding him while he's in pain. Like whatever he needs, I'll always be there. I I love the fact that some of us are blessed with a partner to travel with and it's so nice to be able to experience things with somebody if possible. It's not I would be fine if I went to a zoo for example. Uh, by myself. And I'm sure I would enjoy it and be amazed by it. In fact, I was just watching the um, animal channel. It was really something on Netflix called Animals, right? Yeah. And me and my, my father-in-law were watching it and just being amazed by nature. And so it was more enjoyable because he was there with me, right? Uh, so I just, I'm so help, happy for you that you have a partner to kind of walk through this journey with. And, but I, but my understanding, you mentioned those two beautiful uh, boys, and I, I did get a chance to get a glimpse of them on your website and on a video. I saw a cooking video. And uh, so talk a little bit more about, you know, how they entered your life and what that was like for you and what, you know, what that meant to you. Um, when I was 16, I was told that I had something called PCOS, which is basically a type two diabetes that affects female fertility. And being told that I couldn't have my own children at 16 was pretty like mind blowing. But at the same time, in all aspects of my life, and this is what I suggest to others, instead of being woe is me. Yes, I had I had a moment of that, like, oh my gosh, you know, what did I do? But after that, I grabbed this opportunity and thought of it in a positive light. And just like mm -hmm. when people are like, oh, I can't have bread anymore. I can't have pasta anymore. If you feel that way, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. And not that I realized it at that young age, but I just, I want to be positive. I want to give positivity to the world and to be able to bring children into my home and that needed a mom and dad, like, I feel very blessed to be able to do that. And I ended up starting, um, I wrote, I wrote my first book to help raise money for our adoption. And the fact that people supported us and helped mm -hmm. us through this journey was super cool. Um, and I know when people look at us, I'm white, they're black. Like mm -hmm. they look at us as like, Oh, she's the adoptive mother. Mm -hmm. But to us, it feels like people don't realize how connected we are. Um, you know, we homeschool. We're here all the time. My other son's mm. in the room doing art class. Like, we're together all the time. And I feel like when I do, I have to travel for work sometimes. And when I am gone, it feels like my arm's gone, <laughs> you know. But I know that people look at us like, oh, they're an adoptive family. Like, they don't really understand our connection and our love because – when my when we adopted Micah and Kai, my mom was like, "Wow, those kids were made for you." Like it was just like written in the stars. It's just we have so much love. Um, I feel really blessed. Wow, um, you said you were going to be crying. <laughs> Woo. So let me say this, uh, and the reason why I felt emotion right now is going back to my father-in-law. So when he was diagnosed with dementia, I was uh, knowing what it can do to a family. Uh, all I heard from families was we can't sleep, their you know, behavior's off and all of these things. I'm in, you know, I'm in school getting a master's in nutrition or regional medical director. I'm trying to be a husband and a father and YouTube and podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. So when do you have time, right? And so I'm thinking this is going to be impossible, right? But then I, you know, having learned a little bit about uh, like Care Blazers, for example, it's a YouTube channel where they help people, families learn how to deal with patients with dementia. So I learned a lot from them. And, you know, you have great authors like Amy Berger to teach you things. We're already doing low carb, so that's nothing new. But what I find is that it's not that he just needs like us, we need him. Like So going back to that uh, TV program we watched, the animals program, um, I just, it's so much richer to have somebody with you. Again, going back to your husband, your kids. And, and so when you think about that and put it in perspective and you think about it the right way, which is what you're saying, 
it changes everything. It's all about your perception. And, um, and I, I think in these moments when you're, when things change COVID and things like that, it's just a great opportunity to connect with your family in ways you wouldn't have. So I just, I just, uh, again, it's, I think everybody listening should really pause for a moment and just think about those connections and what they mean to yeah. you. And that's why these relationships are so critical, you know, so yeah, loving they, it. They really, really are. And, um, the first, uh, baby we were placed with died of malaria. And as sad as that was, it brought us to my son, Kai, mm. who, you know, we talk about what happened and stuff and, you know, they talk about their, their brother and it, it's so, it's hard to explain how difficult of a time that we went through, mm. um, to adopt people didn't, you know, a lot of people don't realize how hard it was, but um, it makes me stop. You know, like they say the happiest people take a moment of gratitude. I don't even have to tell myself to do that. It happens because mm. when we were first adopting, I mean, going back to our original, like I didn't tell you this, but when we first started adopting, um, I did go to school for nutrition, but I was good. I was a rock climbing guide. I made about you know, $8 an hour. Cause I was going to be a mom. I was kind of just preparing for the kids to come. Well, Craig lost his job and it was such a, I mean, it was the job we could pay our house payment with. So we ended up losing our house. Mm. We couldn't pay our house payment. We sold our cars because we couldn't afford them. We had nothing. And I was so sad because our adoption, every dime you put into adoption, when you lose a job, goes back to zero mm. because they have to redo your insurance. Uh, you know, they have to do all the information again. So I understand now why they kind of have to start over, but to know that, you know, 20 grand got flushed down the toilet on top of losing a house, everything. I did not want to get out of bed, but it was just the, looking at their pictures and it gave me something to, you know, work towards. And, but with all that hardship, I'm grateful for that hardship <laughs> because it makes me live simply. It makes me live happy. It makes me grateful that I can go to the grocery store and buy anything I want. It makes me grateful that I can eat fresh fish and steak stuff. I couldn't afford. Like it makes me grateful to feed my kids. Well, um, so I'm grateful for those hardships. And I remember being told everything happens for a reason when this was going on and I wanted to punch the person in the face. <laughs> but I understand now. I understand that I had to go through that, getting through the cocoon to become a butterfly and thrive, you know? Um, but it wasn't easy at the time. Yeah. And you can't really completely control that that path to your ideal state and and to your, you know, that, 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 that goal you have in the sky. It's always going to be some bumps along the way. I think about my 90 year old patients and they are rarely coming to me with a, literally a book of things to tell me about their life. Right. So if you're going to make it to 90, 95 or a hundred or beyond, you're going to have a story to tell. And there's, there's bumps and bruises and, but, but, but it's okay. And Steve Harvey had a cool video out. I think it was entitled jump and he said, you got to jump if you're going to be successful in life, and but you're going to probably bump into the mountain and <laughs> you're going to be beat up, but but you jumped and you're living your life and, and that's really what it's all about. So I'm just, so yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of pain. I don't, I mean, trust me, I got to do homework tonight. Do you really think I want to do homework? A guy who doesn't even need to be in school, but I just think that's the pain we have to experience so that when I'm in the presence of someone who may say something that I didn't learn in medical school. Maybe I'll have a nugget in my head because I had a few bruises and those bruises prepare you for moments when you need to bring it up. So that is awesome. But speaking of bruises, um, I know that, you know, you look like you never had a health problem in the world just looking at you now, but <laughs> I know that's not exactly true. <laughs> so I know you've had a transformation yourself. So I, for those who had not heard your story, of how you use uh, your diet to improve your health. Talk a little bit about what you have gotten through and, 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 and what's changed since you've changed uh, with your diet. Oh my gosh. I'm a totally different person. Um, 
when I was 16, I wasn't feeling well. I was twice my size. Um, and I went to my family doctor and at that visit, she said, you have PCOS, uh, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. I had acid reflux really bad. So she gave me a medication for that. Um, I had depression pretty severely, so she gave me a prescription uh, antidepressant, and I had IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, which she gave me something for that. So at that young age of 16, I had three very powerful prescriptions in my hand, and she said it was nothing I was doing wrong. It was just the cards I was dealt in life. But let me tell you, I worked at a coffee shop where before high school, I would go and make the scones and the muffins and the cinnamon rolls. And then after school, I would go and I would uh, work. And we would close about 5 p.m. Whatever didn't sell, I went home with. And so you can be darn sure that I made extra cinnamon rolls because I love them so much. And I would drink mochas all the time when I was there. I was living off of caffeine, sugar, and carbohydrates. And what causes PCOS? Caffeine, sugar, and carbohydrates. And so I had to really look at my diet, not that she helped me, but I realized, okay, I know what I have to change. There wasn't Google back then. This was, you know, 25 years ago. Um, Yes, I'm that old. (laughs) But anyway, I had to research and find out what causes high androgens because in PCOS is high androgens in a female body is caffeine, sugar, and carbohydrates. I did not want to live off of chicken breast and broccoli, and I still do not. So I just got into the kitchen and started making some of my favorite foods, more protein forward, without the carbs, without the sugar, and cutting out the caffeine. And did I lose weight right away? No. But guess what? I never needed that antidepressant. Mm. I never needed the acid blocker, and my IBS cleared up just by changing what I put in my mouth. And Mm. that alone, I know that some people, they'll try the keto diet and I'll say most people do it completely opposite of what I would suggest the way to do it with bulletproof coffees and fat bombs and this Mm -hmm. and that. Um, But when they don't see the scale move, they quit. And for me, it was all about my moods better, my acid reflex gone and my IBS gone. I knew something was going on. Mm -hmm. Something food was healing me, and before you knew it, I kept shrinking. And I used to hate running so much. Did you have to run the mile in school? Oh, yeah. Okay, I would. My mom remembers I would try to break my leg so I did not have to run the mile. And now I run marathons, and it's not because of a weight loss thing, but it's because I love being outside. I love being in nature. You'll never catch me on a treadmill, but I, I'm i more like bounding like a deer through the woods because I just like to be outside, be in nature, get some sunlight, um, and it's just my happy place. And pretty soon I was like, wow, I just want to keep going. And then all of a sudden it was a, a marathon distance, and I was like, wow, let's do this. And now my son, Micah, will be like, hey, mom, can I run with you? And it's like super cool, you know? Wow. And you're reminding me of uh, Michelle Hearn. Uh, she spoke at Low Carb USA, the last one that was done. And she's a runner and she couldn't get out of the tub one day and decided, I can't do this anymore. I made the lifestyle changes. And she went straight to carnivore and she's uh, killing it. I think she just posted something recently where she won the actual, I don't know if it was a short race or long, but she won. I mean, she I mean, it's amazing. So imagine going from being in a tub, can't move, (laughs) to winning a freaking race or marathon. It's like insane. So I I just think it's life transformational. But even I'm thinking about you and your beautiful kids and how, man, how much better can you do your job if you're present and you can do things and you have the energy in there and they're trying to keep up with you instead of the other way around. So I just, it makes life so much richer. It does. There's no way. I know you talked about like you're doing this and that and you're so busy. There's no way you and I could accomplish what we do in a year. I wrote three books last year on top of work, on top of homeschool, all of this. I could never accomplish what I do if I had the cinnamon rolls and the right. all of that type of, even if I ran off of caffeine, I couldn't, I would, you know how when you had, I, I remember having too much caffeine. I felt like a rubber band about to snap, you know? I can't do it at all. It affects my blood sugar way too much. But 
if I ate that type of stuff, which I don't crave that at all anymore, mm -hmm. I could never accomplish what I do in a day. And let me tell you, I was such a picky eater. I made my best friend's mom cry because I would never eat her. She would make pot roast and all this stuff. I mm -hmm. never eat it because I was just like, no, gross. I just wanted junk. So I'm picky. So when people are like, I'm a picky eater, I don't know if I can change. You can change. You just have to try some of my recipes. Yeah, you know? right. And and again, sitting, watching Everybody Hates Chris, old episodes on Netflix with my father-in-law, and uh, they were accustomed to eating uh, cereal uh, for breakfast. I think it was that. I'm not sure which episode. It may have been... Uh, uh, yeah, I think that may have been it, but but the kids, the 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 mom. Oh, actually, it actually was Bernie Mac's show. So the mom was uh, free to help out with the breakfast, right? And she made this really fancy breakfast for the kids, very healthy, very appropriate for what we advocate. And uh, and the father was like, "They're not going to eat that," and he came in with some cereal, right? <laughs> So, and and he was right. They did not want to eat the real food. They wanted to eat the processed food. So I think what happens is our palates have to change. We have to go through a little withdrawal and adapt. And then all of a sudden, the things that were boring, not interesting, become delicious. And, and the cereal, it's like, it doesn't even taste like food anymore. And I think that that's the biggest thing that people have to experience is just be patient and allow the process to occur. So... And that's the thing, um, you know, our kids don't have a, a car. They don't have money. You are in charge. I mean, I get a little like aggressive when it comes to this because nothing makes me more frustrated than seeing a two-year-old eating a French fry because right. the industrial oils, the junk that's in those things, they don't know what a French fry is until you give it to them. And why are you yep. doing it? It's because you want it. The two-year-old doesn't even know how to say French fry. No. It's parenting 101, and it's, again, we have a little bit of a friendship with our kids, but it's really the parenting, and we're, we're really parents first, and the friendship is kind of like a good you know part of it. And yeah, the number of times I've seen patients come in and say, yeah, he won't eat that. And I say, well, first of all, he looks like he's not going to starve if, we, uh, if he doesn't eat today. So let's just see what happens if you don't make those things available. And if he's truly hungry, he'll eat whatever's in front of him. So, and, and most people have to be courageous enough to do that experiment because it works. Uh, but again, I think it's uh, the culture and, you know, I want to be a good parent. Maybe they're working hard and they feel like, well, I got to give in. And I think that when we, can't, p kids want to be led. And we just have to lead them uh, through this crazy life. So yeah. I, one, one person we know and uh, respect is uh, Charles Maddox. And I know you were featured uh, on the uh, reverse document, docu-series. And you had the other great folk like Dr. Uh, uh, Jason Fong, Dr. Kim Berry, others, of course. And, and so I'm curious, um, as you guys have tried to go from how we think about uh, diabetes with the first docu series, and then now with you guys being featured on the second one, where we talk about how you can reverse it. it. Takes courage to say that for some people. I don't think it's that courageous anymore. So, how did you get involved with that project, and what impact do you want that project to have? Um, you know, seeing Charles post about it on Twitter, I believe that was my first, and he didn't say he didn't know who I was. I didn't really know who he was. And I just, I retweeted it and I just reached out. I was like, if you need a cook, I'm here for you. Mm. And I think it started that, you know, I was just going to cook the meals for the participants. Mm -hmm. And in reality, he got me more involved because he realized the knowledge I had. So I would sit down with them because I went through this. Some of the doctors never had a weight issue. They never had um, to, these issues. So I think that they liked me talking about my um, journey and how difficult it was when I would slip or 
um, how, what would help me be successful, like not having it in the house because it would call my name in the middle of the night and just talking them through that. But also Charles got in there and showed me cooking some of the meals. And I mm. think that's what Jerome was one of the participants. He said, when Charles asked me to be on the show again, I didn't think I could eat keto, mm -hmm. but eating your food makes this possible and delicious. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. I don't, I don't want to eat chicken breast and broccoli and all this stuff that a lot of people think is, you know, healthy food, but I made them this pudding. Have you made my pudding made with hard boiled eggs? Mm -mm. Sounds good. Okay. It's, it's, it's a chocolate pudding made with hard boiled eggs. And it sounds so weird, but it's a great way to get protein into your kids. Because what happened is when we first adopted the boys, we didn't have any money. And what's the cheapest keto food? Eggs, right? Eggs. And so I made this pudding out of eggs. And I kept this recipe a secret for probably seven years because it was just too weird to let people mm -hmm. know we eat this pudding made with hard work. <laughs> But then I put it out into the world and people in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, you name it, they're like, this is the best pudding ever. And so, you know, making it for Jerome and everybody, they're like, wow, this could be my breakfast. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, if you're, good, if you're sick of scrambled eggs, make my chocolate pudding, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's just one example of making something delicious out of healthy food, you know. Um, and even Dr. Ken Berry, I think he ate like buckets of that while I was <laughs> here there. And he's like, this is so good, you know? So, um, it was just cool. And that's another thing about if you're depressed or having mood issues, when you get into the kitchen and even when I don't have time, when I create mm -hmm. something that everybody's like, oh, and I can hear them moaning cause they just love it so much. Nothing beats that feeling. Mm. It still feels awesome and it happens every day, but wow. you know, I'm a, like I said, I'm a very busy person just like you are. I don't have time to make a five course dinner every night and I don't, right. but when I do make stuff, I batch cook. And so I have easy leftovers. Um, and you know what? My kids are 10 and 11 or no, they're 11 and 12 now. Mm -hmm. They know how to help. That's right. And if they don't, they certainly should know how. Because this is the life skills. This is why we're in the situation we're in. We, mm -hmm. My mother, she tells me, I, I was told that homemade meals were not as, um, say, like, the if you were a better mother, if you would buy the frozen meals, if you would buy, you know, the pre-made stuff, you were a better mother. That's what the magazines told them. That's mm -hmm. what... The commercials told them right. so making homemade meals was not really a thing for my mom um and that's why the generations just kept going so people don't know how to cook mm -hmm. but that's why it's really important to teach your kids how to do it because that's the future and it doesn't take a long time we were so inspired to make sure our kids were successful and that's they ended up at washu in st louis so that part worked but we didn't spend a lot of time doing those domestic like things. So, however, it just took one summer, you know, they came home. We yep. said, you guys need to know how to cook just in case that other person doesn't. And it only took one uh, summer, even just as importantly, which is why the work you do is so important. They have cookbooks. So just follow the recipe, like not trying to be funny. And then what's really particularly cool that I really, that resonates with me, I think about batch cooking, first of all, I think that's critical. We cook maybe three times a week. Then the other piece is when I was, from my leadership perspective, we learned the lean methodology from Toyota and how they are efficient. But one of the things they do really well is they, you have to problem solve and figure out how can I do this easier and better. So for anybody listening, just think of what can I do easier. So for example, if I learn that you have a great uh, rub for your steak or ribs, and I like that rub, why would I prepare that every time I need it? That doesn't make sense. So a lean methodology would say, let's prepare a big batch one time, and then every time I need that rub, it'll just be sitting there. So it's a very, it's a very simple thing to do, but people just don't do it. And then they're thinking, oh my God, I got to get this stuff together. Do I have all the ingredients? Is the cumin there? Is the onion powder there? And what happens is 
uh, I'm just going to go grab something, <laughs> you know? And so, so we have to remove those barriers so that, so that we won't have a reason not to do it the, uh, the, the, the right way, which is the easy way. So. But here's now, another, like to your point, I think it might even be today is national fast food day. And what we did as a joke, this was probably, I don't know, seven years ago, Craig got in the car with one of the boys and the other boy stayed home with me. He went to Chipotle, which is only about three miles away. And it was Mm -hmm. at like 2 p.m., which is not a busy time. He did not wait in line. Our point was, is it cheaper? Is it faster to get takeout? Okay. Mm -hmm. By the time he went to pick up Chipotle, didn't wait in line and drove home, my son and I, and my son must have been five at the time, we cooked Chipotle at home with organic ingredients, which Mm Chipotle is not organic. And we had leftovers and it was about a fourth of the price. Mm. And we were finished eating by the time he came home. It is not cheaper. It is not faster. Don't fool yourself, but you have to work at it. But you know what? You don't have to go and run marathons. Just get in the kitchen and turn some music on and like bond with your kids. That's right. Here, A lot of people do intermittent fasting with the keto lifestyle and they get all caught up in having to have family meals together, eating together. And I worked with a lot of psychologists that say it's not the actual act of eating together that keeps families together, Mm -hmm. but you, that's sometimes the only time families get together and talk. That's true. So you don't have to worry about eating together. If you're making the meals together, if you're grocery shopping together, teaching your kids how to do that. So, you know, it's not really like when I'm eating, like, man, I want to eat the food and focus on that and like, not really chat. That's kind of my jam. And so, but I do love to chat and talk about what happened that day when we're cooking, when we're cleaning up. We also go on bike rides together. We walk together, whatever. But um, I just want people to leave with that. If you intermittent fast, it's not about eating together, but spending quality time Mm -hmm. together. That's right. I love it. And it's uh, life experiences. That's the E and the ROPE acronym. And your life experiences, they don't just you know, you know, make sure you're around the people that can help you be healthy, I guess, in some ways emotionally, but it really frames how you do things. So if I, if I do this the right way, maybe my, my babies will do it the right way (laughs) and my grandbabies will then do it the right way. So we're really creating a life experience that defines how we see the world and how we do things. And so I a hundred percent agree with that. And I do want to share an interesting fun fact with you uh, Maria, and that is that we have something in common besides, you know, keto, low carb, intermittent fasting, and things like that. Borderline carnivore for sure for me. Um, yeah. I, um, you know, we both have uh, a close relationship with, you know, someone in the acting field. Uh, for you, that actor uh, shares her gift on the big screen, while mine shares her talents in community theater. Uh, but the one thing they also have in common is they both have type one diabetes. And for me, that actress is my wife, Karan, and yours is Holly Berry. So, you know, I met my wife while I was in college in New Orleans at Xavier University and so happy I did that a marriage has been about 28 years now. So my, I'm curious how you met Holly and, uh, how has that relationship uh, impacted your life? You know, um, I think I was uh, hanging out with my kids and all of a sudden I got all of these Instagram messages. Halle Berry is posting about you and her stories and this and that. And I just messaged her, you know, I'm very grateful for your support. She had my book called Quick and Easy Ketogenic Cooking and she was making all the recipes. I said, do you really cook my recipes? And she's like, yes, I do. (laughs) They're so simple. Why wouldn't I do it? I thought she had, you know, some big big chef I was cooking for. (laughs) And she's like, no, I like cooking. And um, I just asked for her address. And my boys and I wrote a letter telling her how, why I wrote the books to help raise money for our adoption. And we mm-hmm. thank her for her support and kind of just, we drew her pictures and stuff and we sent them. And then all of a sudden she wanted to, um, she posted about all my books and she had all of them. And then she's like, do you want to do some cooking videos together? And I'm like, absolutely. And um, yeah, she's just, she could be the biggest diva. I mean, what she's accomplished in her life and she's not, she's one of the nicest women I've ever met. 
Mm. To the point where like, if she wanted something, her assistant will say, go get that for her. She's like, don't be, don't do that. I, mm-hmm. I'm okay. You know, she doesn't even want people to get stuff for, her, you know, she's wow. just so chill and I'm grateful for her. Um, watch for more things in the future, but I can't really talk legally about that. Oh yeah. That. But that's Thank good. I, I'm happy you guys are going to continue to work together. Um, uh, type one diabetics. And again, my wife having that, they don't get the airtime they need. Right. So if we can yeah. get, uh, people like Holly to share a story, people like yourself to help let people know, guess what? This helps for type one diabetes too. Mm -hmm. You know, the amount of insulin my wife has to take, it's very small in comparison to a typical uh, type one. The the stability, not not having to chase the sugars, all of those things is really much better. So continue to do your magic with her. Let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, concerns people have about um, certain types of foods. And we'll start with vegetable oils. And um, I, I, I saw a, a, a treat, a treat re- recently with Amber O'Hearn and um, she was kind of saying, you definitely, you know, it's a concern, but maybe not as much of a concern. So I think there's a little controversy about, should we be concerned? Shouldn't we be concerned? I definitely avoid them. Um, I always tell my patients, Boca butter, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, just to get them a basis. And then there's others but I always, I, I just think if I'm going to play this game uh, and I, and my budget allows, and nowadays you can buy these things, you know, at, at Walmart, why not go with what is probably a better option? So I just wanted to get your thoughts on vegetable oils because so many people, um, they just don't know anything about the concerns related to that. Yeah. What saddens me is there's some pretty prominent, you know, Instagram influencers for the keto diet and they'll get they'll do promotions for like craft mayo or, you know, such and such ranch dressing, which is just basically, you know, processed soybean oil. And Mm -hmm. knowing what I know with uh, clients and my husband and stuff, when they do eat those vegetable oils is probably Mm -hmm. worse for their body than eating sugar. Mm -hmm. Um, They're very inflammatory. I think they're terrible for heart disease, but uh, chronic pain. Like if Craig has those vegetable oils, he's in pain for days. Like you tell me that there's nothing wrong with them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would say, I don't believe that at all. Um, what I see with the research from in 1970s, we, the government subsidizes, subsidized those hydrogenated oils. And since then the obesity rate went like this, the Mm -hmm. heart disease rate went like this ever since those oils started. So you tell me that there's nothing wrong with those oils. Mm -hmm. Honestly, have you eaten them? They taste terrible. Mm. Why would you not want to use duck fat or tallow or lard or butter or coconut oil? Like they taste so much better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just like the Italians, they're very picky about their ingredients. They only use a few in a recipe, but what they Mm -hmm. use are good tasting. I'm telling you, if you made one of my recipes with, you know, soybean oil versus butter, it's going to taste a, big, a heck of a lot better with butter. Different. Yeah. If you can do dairy, right? Right. Of course. And I, I just think that there's levels to this. So what I tell patients, um, I do have uh, vegetable oils as one of the things to avoid. Um, I may tell them to say, let's start doing this, then go to this, then go to this. Um, and so there's levels to this, you know, start, just drink water. Let's start with that, you know, things like that. So, so versus sweet tea. Right. So, and I think that, and then you listen to your body, like if, and I, I generally don't buy, uh, those seed oils anymore, but I tell patients, okay, let's, let's, let's work on that soda and we'll do all of that crazy stuff, which is very more obvious. And then we'll get to that. But I do think, um, there are some people who are going to be impacted more than others. And ultimately, I think people need to work towards this ideal state. The research is going to keep happening and we're going to keep getting more data, but we have enough information out there, even if it's anecdotal, that says probably shouldn't take a seed, process it to death, and then put it into your body. It's probably not a good idea. We're not even going to talk about cottonseed oil and the whole Crisco debacle so anyway i'm really surprised that amber o'hearn posted that being the carnivore that she is yeah uh she's a very 
she she really is very nuanced. So when she tries to support her belief systems, it, it makes she forces you to think. It reminds me of uh, uh, some others, uh, Adele Height, for example, who wrote the uh, Car Restriction. She they force you to think and they question conventional. So let's just say there's an idea in low carb or keto or carnivore that's a standard idea. They force you to think beyond that and question your own beliefs. Well, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah. But but I think we just need we we're going to need more and more science. But for individuals, if your body says, I'm having some aches after I eat vegetable oils, do we need any other data than that? Like, that's all I need. So I think that that data is the most important because there are going to be times when the what's best for the masses is not, not always good for the individual. So I think you have to kind of play that game too. But yeah, so nothing but respect uh, for those guys. But I just think you have to, they force us to think, and which is really important. Um, one thing that you mentioned earlier, uh, was coffee. Um, and, um, so I want to hear your thoughts on coffee in terms of the impact that it has had on your life, negative or positive. And, you know, what's your thoughts in general about whether people should consume it or not? Um, like I said earlier, I worked at a coffee shop since I was 15. I loved coffee. I loved every kind of coffee. Um, I was addicted to it. Um, but there came a point and it was probably the last thing I should say vegetable oils were probably the last thing I cut out, but mm -hmm. coffee was very difficult for me to cut out. But once I did, I'm not a very anxious person, but what anxiety I did have went from here to here. Mm. Um, you know, I'm very chill. Everybody's like, how, how are your teeth so white? I was like, I don't mm -hmm. drink wine. I don't drink coffee and I don't drink, you know, any colored things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's huge when it comes to staining your teeth. But more than anything, coffee on average will increase your blood sugar about 8%. Mm. It does make an impact. And not only that, coffee is the most mold containing product out there. Mm. So when you think about people with these underlying issues, a lot of it, could be a mold toxicity that is, you know, underlying that we don't really know about whether they have yeast or chronic pain or heart issues. I had a dear friend of mine. Um, he died at the age of 23. Mm, mm. Um, I gave him resuscitation and he didn't live. Mm, um, mm. And it was from mold toxicity. So yeah, I'm really passionate yeah. about that. And it was more than just coffee for him. It was, you know, in his, the bedroom he lived in and stuff. So that's like, but that's a big deal. Like mold is, black mold is terrible for you. And coffee has that, um, you know, it causes anxiety. It causes high androgens in a female body. Mm -hmm. And when you have too high of androgens, that's when you get things like PCOS. So mm -hmm. If someone's very serious about their fertility, a female, I would say I would cut it out. Um, there is research to show that it increases testosterone, just like, you know, the androgens would be higher for a male. Um, I just, I feel so much better without it. I'm so much calmer, um, yeah. cool and collective. Um, and especially women going through uh, menopause or perimenopause, you're much more sensitive to not only carbohydrates, but caffeine too. And you're already very sensitive and have sleep issues. Why not cut it out? So you're mm -hmm. going to sleep better. That anxiety that you have because you have low progesterone, that's going to be lowered. You know, it's just a whole nother step of healing. If you're not ready for that, there's no judging, but I think that knowledge is power. Just like you said, yeah. it causes you to think about things like, Hey, yeah, maybe I shouldn't be having three cups of coffee a day. Maybe I can lower it to mm -hmm. one. That would That's be great. my goal. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, is a lot of people will switch to decaf coffee, but decaf coffee is made with a chlorinated filtration process, which is mm -hmm. really harmful for the thyroid. And so I would say, if you're going to try to lower the caffeine, try a decaf Americano, which is a shot of decaf espresso. And then you add hot water to it because espresso has less caffeine than a cup of coffee does. Most people don't realize that. It's just very mm -hmm. concentrated. Mm -hmm. But 
that's how I transitioned off is I would do a decaf Americano, which is just a shot of decaf espresso, which made it, is made with a water filtration process. And then I added hot water to it. Now I'm really into cold therapy, so I don't do anything hot. I haven't had a hot drink. It's just I changed my palate. I changed what I crave. So now I'm really into just cold cold water, ice water, cold therapy in general. I As I think about who's listening to this podcast, there may be people who are just starting their journey. For those people, reduce your carbs. <laughs> as we advance and become more nuanced, we start adding those other things we start to remove our, from our lives. And, you know, it may be that vegetable oil. It may be uh, coffee. And because a lot of people don't realize, I, I know in my training, I learned that, you know, um, caffeine reduces your insulin sensitivity. So if I'm reducing my insulin sensitivity and, you know, really the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems we have in our world now is we have insulin resistance, right? So the last thing I want to do is go in the other direction. And so that'll be, so why not start taking away the things that will affect my insulin sensitivity and add the things yeah. that help me? Why not take away those things that could be toxic, as you've described? Uh, if you think about my nest and rope acronym, the P is for avoiding pollutants that harm us, right? So if we avoid pollutants from diet or just from the air we breathe, now we have created a body that is more capable of dealing with things that may harm us, like if COVID just happens to find its way, right? So now I have a body that didn't have that extra toxin, didn't have, you know, these things that will make me more vulnerable. And now I can handle uh, a scary infection like that much better. So I, I love that. I loved what you said about like, if you're new, just cut out the carbs. Let's start there. Because when I look at, when I, when I was in college, when I'd look at a syllabus that I had to accomplish all this stuff in a semester, I'd freak out. Yeah. And so for me, my diet was changing one thing at a time and it was cutting grains and carbohydrates out at first Mm -hmm. that was like my first journey and until i accomplished that once i did i would i would add a new goal Mm -hmm. and then once i accomplished that i would add a new goal and i still add new goals to this day yeah i'm always trying to improve myself um be a better mother wife whatever it is and that's if someone would have told me maria you're going to be a carnivore when I was 16 years old in order to get healthy, I wouldn't have even tried. Am I a carnivore now? I've, I, I'm close. I'm like you, you know? Yeah, I'm right I, there. I, yeah. I do use spices and onions and garlic for That's flavor right. and stuff. But with Craig, he's a complete carnivore for his illness. But if you would have told me you, you're going to eat like you do, I, I would have never even have tried. But now That's I've right. changed. I evolved. And that's what it's all about. It's just making yourself a better human. Yeah. And, and being flexible. One of the reasons why I think I'm not 100% carnivore and why I will have a non-starchy side, you know, as well sometimes is because I'm not trying to create these rules of, you know, of engagement where I just can't. So if I decide I want to have something, I'll have it if it's something that has not historically harmed me. Mm-hmm. So I listen to my body and I, I move in that direction and I... I really think that's important. I think since we're, uh, I feel like we're teaching right now. So let's do a little bit more of that and talk about, you know, I saw one of your videos you did with the oxidative priority principle. uh, And I just want to share that with listeners because it kind of speaks to, you know, how you kind of remove things uh, gradually or how you prioritize things. So just talk a little bit about what that, whole principle oxidative priority principle is yeah it sounds like this big complicated thing but what it comes down to is the order of what your body processes different fuels and the first fuel if you eat a whole bunch of different things including alcohol alcohol is the first fuel that it has to metabolize or basically get rid of your uh, through your body because it's completely toxic there's no storage capacity site so Say, you know, if you had a big potato with butter and a steak and a glass of red wine, it has to metabolize the wine first before it moves on to all the other food you ate. So 
I say, well, let's just cut it out because it's a depressant. You know, I was just on the phone with someone who's severely depressed and she had alcohol the night before. And I was like, we know alcohol is a depressant. You know, it's not making you feel any better. Um, so alcohol is oxidative priority number one. Number two is exogenous ketones, which maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, but it's these um, fake ketones, basically these ketones that you can drink that will get you into ketosis faster. Are they healthy? I don't think so, but they could serve a purpose in some case of maybe Alzheimer's, dementia, something like that. But a lot of people drink those because they want to lose body fat and they've heard Oh, if I get into ketosis, I'm going to lose body fat. Well, if you're consuming ketones, there's no reason that you have to use body fat to make ketones because you just used a fake product to do that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's number two. Mm -hmm. Number three is carbohydrates. Carbohydrates. You have, um, you know, a pretty good storage capacity site of about 2000 calories, whatever. Um, but that's the, that's what's going to happen. Third, the fourth one mm -hmm. is protein. And the thing is, with carbohydrates, they're not needed. People mm -hmm. think that right. they need them for certain things, but they're, they're really, they're, there's no dietary need for carbohydrates, None. but protein, there is a dietary need for protein. First of all, it's the most nutrient dense food you're going to ever find. That's where the nutrients are. It's not in the MCT oil. It's not in the butter. I mean, whether you think high fat or high protein is more important, you cannot ignore the fact that if I put a steak in front of you, or if I put a plate of butter in front of you, the nutrients are in the steak. Mm. Okay. But the protein is going to cause beautiful hair, beautiful skin. All of the building blocks of your body mm -hmm. needs protein. When women in particular do a keto diet, they're like, oh, Maria, I'm losing my hair, my thyroid suffering, this and that. They're usually doing bulletproof coffee and fat bombs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in that case, they're probably not losing very much weight because their their body is using the dietary fuel for ketones not their body fat so exactly. protein is number four but then dietary fat is number five um and i'm not saying no dietary fat i'm just saying prioritizing protein because you need it for muscle you need it for so many things of your body and the nutrients are there and then fat you use as a lever so if you want to lose body fat we're going to turn that dial down. And guess what? 99% of people have some, you know, they want to lose body fat. That's why they come to keto. Turn the dietary fat down. The steak has enough fat in it. You don't need to add a stick of butter to it. But that's what they're reading online. And that's why I get so sad. Like, oh, I tried the keto diet. I talked to all these people all mm -hmm. over the place. I tried the mm -hmm. keto diet and it didn't work for me. Well, this is why Jillian Michaels says the keto diet is going to kill you because She's reading, oh, they're just drinking butter in their coffee. And, you know, that's not what we are promoting. Some are. That's not what right. I'm promoting. Mm -mm. Um, and so, you know, prioritizing protein. Um, if you're having a hard time hitting your protein goal, I have a free calculator that kind of calculates how much protein you need. Um, if you're having a hard time hitting that, you probably need to maybe instead of a ribeye all the time, go mm -hmm. to a leaner steak because that's going to mm -hmm. be a better protein to fat ratio. Where's um, this calculator? How do you go that? to keto Maria.com? Mm -hmm. um, there's a link to the free calculator. Okay, it's totally cool. free. We spent a lot of money on it, but it was really helpful for people to find out. Oh my gosh, I'm not getting near the amount of protein I need. Mm -hmm. And when they flip the fat and the protein, they're like, oh my gosh, it's working. Right. That's right. And they yep. feel better too. And their hair grows back, you know? So that's, but if you are doing the traditional keto diet was for epilepsy and seizures. Mm -hmm. And that's why people think it's a super high fat diet. Well, you know what? The traditional American diet is high fat already. That's right. Oh yeah. We don't need to add any more to it. Mm -hmm. We just need to make sure it's the good fat and then prioritize protein, lower the carbs. That's right. Yeah, I think a lot of us are not even uh, saying high, low carb, high fat anymore. We're just trying to restrict the carbs. Most of the time, the body will take care of the rest on its own. My, very few of my patients measure their macros, their 
protein, fat, or carbs. Very nobody's really doing that. I just focus on the carbs, and obviously, when they're struggling, and, and with an emphasis on get adequate protein, you know. Mm-hmm. So, but very few people are having to measure much, and then when people struggle, we uh, adjust. I've rarely talked to a patient who uh, struggled so much that I couldn't figure out why they were struggling. Like there's always a reason. Uh, I had a patient recently who was struggling, very due diligent. He writes down everything and and he does a really good job. But what I didn't know is that he was doing that, you know, dirty keto and he consumed a ton of bread, right? Mm-hmm. And um, And for some people that's fine, you know, get a low carb or keto friendly bread, but he, I honestly think that that was his problem. He just didn't understand that that for his body is not going to work. And so I think once he eliminates that, we're still in the process. I think that that's going to get better. But there's always a reason, just like we talk about the root cause of disease. There's a reason for everything. There's no, not a lot of mysteries. We don't know everything, but we just have to keep peeling the onion until we find the the answer. And I think that's exactly what we all have to do. So um, you talked a little bit about mental health and how things changed. And I just want you to talk just a little bit more about the impact that uh, keto can have on mental health. What things have you learned over the years that people should know? Well, there's so many things. Um, I guess the biggest takeaway I want people to know is 90% 90% of serotonin comes from the gut. And when you have a damaged gut and you're just inflaming it with the vegetable oils and the sugar and the carbo, you keep it inflamed, you know, um, mm-hmm. that's going to cause a lot of issues with brain neurotransmitters. Um, high histamines can cause, can block serotonin. So that's a whole nother thing, but it depends on the person. Um, animal protein has amino acids that help make serotonin. So that's a really important piece. And that's why it's really um, a big component of healing. But also dairy and gluten, their protein have this cellular mimicry to what our neurotransmitters look like. So a lot of times patients, when they get rid of dairy and gluten, that's when they start to heal because Mm -hmm. the proteins are causing the cellular mimicry to the fact where they're not making any more serotonin or acetylcholine or dopamine or any of this because it's being blocked. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm grateful. I went through my diet change 25 years ago when Mm -hmm. there wasn't the keto breads, there wasn't the keto products out there because those are all filled with like the, the keto bread at Costco is filled with gluten. Nobody's Mm going to get better on that, Mm -hmm. you know? So Um, if it comes out of a package, think twice. Yeah. Think twice. Yeah. It should be, uh, if you tolerate it at all, kind of a cheat thing. It shouldn't be like a regular thing. Um, and I think people have to be able to understand, okay, it's not an essential thing to life. That's number one. (laughs) And you don't have to eat, you know, uh, those bready type products all the time because the other food tastes delicious. And again, with these creative recipes, uh, I think that that'll help people to make that transition a little easier. So um, I, I one fun fact, and you don't fit the image of a hunter, <laughs> <laughs> but you have a little hunting in your background. So uh, curious if you got that from your family or where did this hunting background come from? Oh, well, I grew up in North central Wisconsin. Do you know Tombstone pizza? Yes. That was the first frozen pizza ever invented. And my dad, oh. that was invented in Medford, Wisconsin. That's where I grew up. My dad worked oh. at the bar that was across from our graveyard, hence the name Tombstone pizza. Um, and anyway, yes, my whole family hunted. And what's interesting is Um, my, my parents, especially my mom grew up so poor that her dad would basically poach deer in order to eat. Mm -hmm. And that we don't do that. But, um, I grew up bow hunting. I don't use a gun. 
but you know, I use a bow and arrow, which takes a mm. lot of skill, a lot mm. of patience. Um, you know, like I wear actually wear a shower cap because I can't, even though I don't use product on my hair, it still smells, you know? So mm -hmm. like all the scent has to be away because a deer has to be very close for you in order to get a shot. They can't be looking at you. Like it's not like gun hunting at all. Uh, but yeah, I, I bull hunt. Um, I shot, um, oh, like a massive buck last year and I posted it on Instagram mm. and I think I lost a thousand followers in an hour. Wow. And some of the comments I got was you should be like the rest of us civilized humans and buy your meat at the store, <sighs> which makes me terribly sad because I don't have a four wheeler. I told you my husband's sick and my kids are little and I'm not very big either for us to drag a deer out was so much work. My boys are like, mm -hmm. Oh mom, I hate doing this. I was like, this is how people ate. Mm -hmm. I wanted, I was kind of gruff with them because I wanted them to realize they watched me gut the whole thing out and quarter it. And I want people to realize where their food comes from. Right. But they just go to Chipotle and boom, they have a delicious meal. They're so removed from the process of what it comes from. And I was very proud. I was so hurt that people were so cruel because mm -hmm. I was so, I, I lovingly worshiped, not worshiped, but I thanked the deer for giving its life. My whole family ate. We did not waste one piece of it. Um, even my dog, I fed my dog. Like we, we, he, that fed us for months. Mm -hmm. And that deer had a great life. Mm -hmm. gallivanting around in my woods mm -hmm. and yeah. what people don't realize is there's a limiting factor mm -hmm. and a limiting factor is if you don't have hunters, they're going to die of starvation. Mm -hmm. They're going to die mm -hmm. of you hitting them with your car and ruining your mm -hmm. car and possibly hurting you. Mm -hmm. They're going to, you know, they're going to die somehow. Mm -hmm. There's so many deer that I had 10 deer tags. 10, which is unheard of. You usually get two, but mm -hmm. there's so many deer that again, they're going to get hit by cars and possibly hurt somebody in your family. They're going to die of starvation, which is a waste, you know, like why not allow hunting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going back to watching that animal program on Netflix, right? Um, first of all, shout out to all the ladies. I did not know that the female lions did all the hunting. I, I promise you, I didn't know that. I was like, what? The king's just sitting around, you know, protecting the kids and eating all the food when she brings it back. It's like, so shout out to all the females that help to support our families, right? Uh, but, but it was really interesting to reflect on what living in a wildlife is like. And I think about regenerative farming and and how if we raise animals ethically and and we they i think their lives would be better in some ways because you, you you don't have to spend every day looking up waiting for somebody to put their claws on you you know their teeth on your neck so so i think a lot of this stuff is perception and that person who was critical of you or those people they again didn't think about the 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 harm if you want to go there that occurred with those animals that they never saw. Like, so so in their brain, they think that this is worse. Well, in a way, this is way better, but they just don't see it. So we, and that's what these conversations are about, having a different perspective, another way of looking at things. And, and now maybe looking at that hunter in a different way, because if you think about you honoring the animal, um, how many people go to Jill or, you know, Costco or Walmart or wherever they get their food from and they honor their food. Uh, I, I just don't think that's a thing. So, uh, so I think that, and the fact that you cook the food together, I mean, you make this an event, right? So, but, but hopefully somebody listening will pause and reflect on that. And, but I know when I spend time on Twitter, it's a little, you know, crazy place. And, you know, maybe in, in a lot of those places, people just, they, they see a, they see something and they just react. So hopefully some of those people will hear this interview and uh, think 
uh, I get about it again. So you said you're now how close to Chicago? Because I'm in Chicago. How close? How long would it take for you to get to Chicago from where you are? Um. Well, now I'm in Hawaii. Oh, there's the beach. They, I don't know if you can oh, see that. Oh Lord, I can. So yep. jealous. There's the beach. The whales are coming. Um, but. Uh, we usually live in Hudson, Wisconsin, which is closer to Minneapolis. It's probably okay. a five hour drive to Chicago. Okay. Where Medford is probably more like a six and a half, seven hour drive to Chicago. Okay. So it's okay. it's pretty north. Yeah, I see. So that just gives me a sense. I just wanted to get it. Because you know, we're now advocate Aurora and Aurora is in Wisconsin. So we we've even had meetings, but most of our meetings are on the border, so you know, so that people won't have to travel so yeah. far. So I just wanted to get a feel for that. And the last question, before the last question, is your motivation to help people. You've done great work, inspired, you know, you've upset some, but mostly you've inspired people. <laughs> so what's your motivation to continue to inspire people? Um, my motivation is probably seeing so many of my family members suffer and die from things that were caused by food. Like mm-hmm. my grandpa Vince had his first heart attack at age 32. Mm. And it was because his doctor said never eat butter. Um, mm. Never eat. He loved lard sandwiches when he was a kid. He's like, never eat lard, never eat butter. And it was all margarine that he ate. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't believe it's not butter, all of that type of stuff. Um, and he also had a stressful life too, but I believe food took his life because he had um, two more heart attacks after that. And then my grandpa Jerry died of complications from type two diabetes. And, you know, in the end, I really wanted to help him. But he's like, Maria, I am, you know, 90 years old. I am never going to give up my beer and popcorn. Like, let me just because he was on dialysis at the end. Um but they knew how to change his, their food, but they were so, I guess, addicted at that point. Mm-hmm. Sure. So that's why I'm really like when I got triggered about the two year old eating French fries, that's where it starts. Mm, that's where it starts. Okay. Yeah, it does. It does. So, you know, just know that you're starting your children off right when you're feeding mm-hmm. them good food. And yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's important. Um, I just had a half day clinic today and I had a 67 year old just diagnosed with dementia that is way too young to be diagnosed with dementia number two I had a 57 year old diagnosed with a TIA a transient ischemic attack and you see all those little blood vessels clogged up in a 57 year old and there were other issues but those are too young so and it's all metabolic disease metabolic syndrome metabolic dysfunction insulin resistance and so the message to all of those who are watching or listening is that if we can fix that let's do that and by the way the pills won't do it the surgeries won't do it the procedures won't do it. It's all about lifestyle. And if you can just take these baby steps, walk towards healing, and think about where there's gaps and work on those gaps, you will not only bless yourself with a longer, healthier life, but the family that you one day will leave behind, that next generation, they'll be blessed with a longer, healthier life. So it's just a beautiful prospect. And it's such a it's so cool to get excited about nutrition when you know the impact it'll have on all of our destinies and all of our lives today. So, so speaking of making sure you stay healthy and making sure we have more books and projects that we are going to find out about later, <laughs> you know, when it comes to nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, how we think recovering from trauma and then a rope, you know, prom, you know, helpful relationships, avoiding organisms and pollutants, and of course, having life experience that serve us and protecting our emotions. Where do you plan to focus your attention over the next 12 months or so? Um, honestly, um, spending more time with my kids. 
because mm-hmm. I'm not going to cry on you again. But Mm-mm, don't cry. <laughs> um, oh, man, they're growing up so fast. Yeah. And they're like the coolest. They are the coolest kids ever. Like I know when COVID happened, people are like, oh, my gosh, I have to be home with my kids. They're driving me nuts where, man, I just love hanging out with them. And mm-hmm. I, you know, being in that time of destitute, I got on that treadmill and I would say yes to everything. First of all, I'm a yes. I, I think it's great to say yes to opportunities. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think I missed out on a lot of their growing up. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I'm with them all the time at the same time. So Craig's like, why do you say that? But at the same time, like, I just want to, when they say, hey, mom, will you want to go for a walk? No, I can't. I, I got to do this, you know? Right. Those things can wait because mm-hmm. they're going to be teenagers and I'm going to be chopped liver, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So those well, relationships. I, I really want to spend more time with them. I'll call it relationships and life experiences will be your focus. I, I love that. And again, watching you interact with your son in that video I saw with you in the cooking, uh, cooking video, it's it's just beautiful. And it's 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 a great way to help people not only cook better but to do it with their family. So keep doing that great work. And of yeah. course, so happy we found each other. Same so happy here. I've had this opportunity and I really want to thank you for coming to the Protecting Your Nest podcast, Maria. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. And as we wrap up, I think that it's clear that we have gotten a little bit more clarity and that clarity relates to how we can use diet, how we think, and our relationships to help us achieve metabolic health. And so as you focus on nutrition and your diet and all these various aspects, I want you to continue to share that inspiring message that was heard today, that we don't have to be sick, we don't have to be mentally unclear, we don't have to be tired, we don't have to be living with chronic illness. There's another way. And so, And I'm thankful, actually, because I'll release this episode during the Thanksgiving Day weekend. So, you know, we're going to give thanks to uh, our guests. We're going to give thanks to you for being here today and just, you know, being part of this conversation. And I'm just hoping that there's just one or two nuggets you can walk away from and apply it in your life. So, So with that, I thank you for being with us today. And as I always say... Continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest. Thank you, guys.